What's up photographers? Welcome back to the studio. Uh, this tutorial is sort of a, a follow-up on our previous assignment. Um, right now we're kind of thinking through exposures, right? How do I get the best possible exposure given the equipment I have and maybe the lighting setup I have? And um, What are ways that we can um, sort of tweak the studio lighting or our environmental lighting or take advantage of environmental lighting? What are things we can do in the camera? And then what are things we can do in post or in Photoshop um, to sort of bring out the best possible exposure. So uh, this tutorial is um, a bit more in depth. The previous tutorial kind of laid a baseline down, right? Like what can my camera do in full auto? This tutorial starts to kind of ratchet up the level of difficulty and sophistication in thinking about lighting and, and what we can do to maximize, uh, basically maximize um, the quality of the image before we even get to Photoshop. Uh, to actually do our studio setup today, uh, we're going to use our um, Infinity Backgrounds again, just this piece of white paper as a slip. Uh, go ahead and just use your same model. Uh, I've got mine set up here with one of these um, cheap Home Depot clip lights again and a little LED you know, screw-in light bulb you might see around the house. Uh, nothing too fancy. The only thing that I'm adding to that setup uh, from what we used um, in the previous video are a couple of white pieces of cardboard or white foam core or just even white paper would work. Um, we'll talk about those here in a second. But let's actually talk um, about some uh, changes to the camera itself. Our previous uh, assignment was shot in full auto. Um, sort of thinking like, okay, let's see what the camera can do uh, in terms of like, well, I bought a really nice camera, right? It should be able to take good pictures. Well, let's just see what it can do. Um, it very likely took, you know, halfway decent images. Um, auto on these cameras is pretty good, um, but we're going to kind of reveal some of the kind of flaws and hiccups along the way here and how we can actually um, do better than auto on your camera. Uh, but at first, right, it's always a little scary. You switch it over into full manual and stuff just turns to the whole pot, like terrible images, too dark, too light. Um, so today we'll actually talk a bit about how to do that better. Um, I also want you guys to switch uh, over to shooting raw if you haven't already done that. I have a little keyboard shortcut on my camera, uh, or sort of an external uh, shortcut. If I heard hold down quality and toggle the wheel, I go from a fine quality JPEG to camera raw. If you gotta go cycling through your menus, go nuts. Um, it's gonna be found somewhere under image quality. And uh, usually you see a whole list of different qualities of JPEGs and then um, maybe a raw file plus JPEG. Now what's gonna happen with that NEF plus JPEG is that it's actually going to save two files every click. Uh, like for example, if, um, if you were doing a photo shoot and you knew you were gonna take all these to, uh, to do a bunch of post-production editing, but um, say your client wanted everything to be emailed to them, they wanna see it like immediately. It's very difficult to send um, raw files to people and expect them to be able to open. You know, imagine sending it to like your grandma, right? Like she doesn't have the software to execute a raw file, but they're also really big and ungainly. So you can set your camera to shoot both files simultaneously, same image. Um, you just have a real sendable kind of kick out, almost like a thumbnail image. Uh, JPEG file. That's going to chew up a ton of space on your card, so just shoot the raw file. Uh, for what we're doing here in class for these assignments, uh, we're always going to want to get the highest possible quality. Now speaking of quality, I want to talk a little bit about sort of some of the problems of the quality I set you out on uh, almost immediately. I set you guys out on an assignment to uh, essentially use a single light source and um, illuminate your subject from you know from an angle and then photograph it at another angle right essentially setting up this arrangement right where I've got a camera angle coming in and then um, a light coming down this is gonna be kind of a really obscenely close arrangement here but um, you kind of get the idea so incredibly hot highlights over here and then I've got these inky black shadows uh, on the opposite side um, to make that even uh, even more dramatic I'll kill my video lighting uh, which is really, really bright and sort of filling my back shadows here. So you get a sense of, um, of how dark this area is going to get. Now, even though um, I can see these dark shadows, you know, as I'm standing there in the studio, uh, I, I can still see into them. Um, I can still uh, plainly see detail back in here. Uh, but your eyes are way better at seeing uh, dynamic range than... Uh, than your camera is. Um, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, uh, 
kind of a novice mark, a mark of a novice photographer to sort of constantly be forgetting this. Um, but this really intense highlight and this deep dark shadow on opposite ends of the subject um, is basically an impossible exposure for most cameras. Uh, smartphone cameras are particularly bad at this and so they have a lot of onboard software to try to balance these out a little bit. So essentially your photographs are being edited uh, before you even get to do anything with them. As you take the picture, it cycles it through some image um, editing software. Uh, one of the most popular ones is right the HDR mode on, on Apple. It's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, it's, it's not a high quality camera necessarily. It's high quality software that's managing the picture after you take it. Uh, so what, uh, what talented photographers do is they tend to have a much better understanding of what the capabilities of their camera is. Um, and in general, it kind of goes like this, right? Like if you didn't spend a ton of money on your camera, more light is always going to be better, right? The camera tends to not see very well in the dark. And so these deep dark shadows here aren't going to look like what I see them as, kind of a nice gray tone. They're going to look black. They're going to look really, really deep. And that, you know, nice, brilliant white highlight, it's not going to look, you know, nice, crisp, sharp paper. It's just going to be totally blown out. And so you'll be really frustrated, right? It's a pretty narrow look. Uh, cameras that sort of live in the probably $200 to $1,000 range um, have a pretty narrow view of what's seeable, right? Where your eye can easily pick up, right? The really bright highlights here in the dark shadows. Uh, but to make this sort of more obvious. Imagine, right, you've spent the whole day at school, you're indoors all day long, and it's like May, right? Bright, sunny day. And so you go from being inside, your eyes and your brain have totally, accust uh, totally adjusted to the darkened lighting space in the school, and you bust out the doors at three o'clock, and, uh, and the sun is just blinding. And for a few seconds, it takes a minute, it, you know, it takes a few seconds for your eyes to adjust. Um, it's not just that your pupils have to contract and, and a few things. It's like your, your brain has sort of like been adjusted to that dim lighting all day long and it takes a moment. Um, your camera experiences that all of the time. And so you, the photographer, have to constantly be thinking about um, the narrowness of your camera's dynamic range and, and what you're going to have to do to compensate for it. Um, now, I hate to admit this because it honestly, it's like, so many young photographers already believe this anyway, probably over believe it, but the, the more money than you, you, that you probably put into your equipment early on, um, the broader the dynamic range is. And so uh, in, in some senses, right, like the less skilled you have to be as a photographer in order to get good exposures, you can just kind of point your camera out there and, you know, because of the broader dynamic range of higher end sensors, full frame sensors and up, um, you'll get a, a deeper spectrum. On top of that, the raw uh, image format versus a compressed JPEG is significantly different as well. If you shoot JPEG, you're compressing that image down to a, a, to a narrower spectrum of black to white. Uh, and if you shoot raw, you sort of stretch out your dynamic range a little bit and your images have less clipping, they have less blown out areas and less deep dark shadows that are impossible to pull out in, in uh, Photoshop. So let's actually sort of set this thing up in a way that's going to help us understand um, how we can mitigate that in the studio before we even click the shutter, how we can balance out our lighting a little bit uh, to make sure that our camera receives the best possible lighting so that we can get a lot more out of it in Photoshop. So I said before that, you know, this arrangement here is a, is a little bit obscene. Uh, you know, I've got this intensely hot highlight here in the deep dark shadow. But, you know, for the sake of uh, demonstration, let's go with this for a moment because it, it'll make it really obvious. I'm going to switch off my, uh, my video lighting here. So I'm pretty much just working with the hot light here in the studio. It's not exactly mono light because I have some house lights up. But um, in this setup, it's a single light source. It's really obvious in the, uh, in the photographic image and the video because I've got, you know, uh, a really kind of um, dynamic difference divided right about halfway through the image, uh, intense highlights and deep dark shadows. Now, if I wanted to open up the shadows on this side. Uh, I suppose I could just go get a whole other light fixture, but um, oftentimes two light fixtures uh, become more complicated to balance. Um, really dynamic, really nice exposures um, allow for the shadows to sort of stay put, but I just need to open them up. Enter the bounce, right? Now I'm going to kind of lay the bounce in close and sort of bounce some of the light back that's sort of spilling off the outside of my light source here back into the shadows. And as I kind of fill 
and remove that light, you can see it's like I'm turning the lights on inside the shadows. I'm not blowing the shadows out completely. They're still there. Uh, I've still got really good kind of contrast between the highlights and the lowlights, but I've narrowed the dynamic range a little bit so that um, the camera doesn't have to see such extremes. Uh, we can take this further, right? Um, because this, uh, this really intense highlight is kind of killing me. I need to kind of back up that light source a little bit. And as I back it up, you'll notice that that highlight sort of softens out. Putting a little bit of distance uh, between the, the light source and your subject is going to end up softening uh, the light as well. Um, now, I'm still kind of blasting this light directly at my subject, which is a really great way to get a nice intense uh, highlight, but this is going to help soften out that dynamic range even more. It lowers the intensity of my highlights and it allows me to still bounce in a bunch of that light. Now the shape and the color of these bounces, um, it, it for the purposes of like we're working on probably doesn't matter too much, but the larger your bounce, the more light you're going to be filling in. And so if you wanted to just fill sort of a small area, you could bounce in with a small bounce. I'm really trying to open up quite a bit of space here on my on my subject, so I'm really trying to um, use the biggest bounce I have. Um, now, another thing that you can do is not only bounce the light into the fill, uh, but you can make your main light, or what we'll call our key light, can actually use reflected light for that as well. Um, now, I'm going to kind of reposition my lighting here and sort of fire it up into space, right, so that it's not even lighting my subject anymore. Uh, but I'm going to use this nice bright board to sort of bounce that light back in. Many, many, many studio photographers, like they don't bother using this sort of direct light. They'll use a uh, light that's been bounced in, uh, either off of a wall or off of a ceiling. This is a really handy way uh, to sort of soften the on-camera flash unit, by the way. If you uh, really are trying to kind of uh, use the on-camera flash for some, uh, for some good fill light, um, bouncing it off of a wall or bouncing it off of a card is a really excellent way to soften that out. And then I'll bring in a second bounce to sort of fill the shadow on the opposite side. Now, for those of you guys who have three arms, this is uh, this is great, right? Because you, you'll need an arm for one bounce, an arm for the other bounce, and an arm for the camera. Um, and so this can get really complicated. You, um, you know, It's not uncommon to see photographers um, who have lighting assistants to sort of help with this lighting situation or really sort of complicated um, uh, uh, rigging stands, C stands and other things that can hold bounces in different positions. I'm going to take just a second and try to rig, uh, rig this one in a couple of ways. I'll use uh, a second or a third sort of like setup here. I'll make sure I turn off my overheads and I'll click a couple of really soft, really gentle images. Uh, I'm just going to leave my camera in, in full auto shooting in RAW. And then I'll, uh, I'll do a few more and talk you through how I might kind of make a few of these changes. So I've got myself set up uh, to do a couple of different versions of this picture, right? Um, I am going to attempt one where I've sort of bounced the light off of this card. And so um, I've made use of a small tripod that I have in my studio. Uh, you can wire this thing up any way you need to, right, to get it down as close as possible. I probably should do my best to get that card as close to uh, to my subject as possible given the you know crazy setup and you know in true studio photography style like I've got something set up that you like just hope and pray doesn't collapse on anybody and hurt anybody but um, when uh, when you're doing these sort of experiments uh, it doesn't have to look pretty right the subject is down here every all the kind of apparatus the lighting apparatus that's in the background oftentimes uh, is, re is really kind of uh, atrocious and scary and it's like cobbled together with tape and stuff. That's just fine. Um, the emphasis is not to make your setup look beautiful, but to get the lighting just right. So I'll run through a couple of examples here, some with sort of bounced lighting and some with um, maybe direct light, but fill bounce. Uh, the big idea here is the less direct sort of blasted light that I can have and the more sort of soft bounced light, um, that's going to kind of result in a much gentler uh, light space and give me a much better kind of material to work with in Photoshop. Uh, strangely, uh, the images that I'll produce with all this bounced light are going to end up looking a little flat, a little soft. Uh, and so right out of the camera, they're not going to be quite as dynamic as maybe you're accustomed to seeing, but don't worry, uh, we'll pull these into Photoshop later and, um, and do some edits. And you'll see what I mean, how I can kind of pull a lot more out of them. 
Uh, so we'll just kind of start with a single light source that's been bounced down and I'll kill my overhead uh, video lighting to make that all happen. And now I will uh, I'll sort of bring in my second card here and this is where you know, I'm going to start running out of hands pretty quickly. So I have um, a couple different solutions, right? I can probably, uh, if I'm, if my focal uh, length here is uh, is doable, I can just set the camera right on the table. I'm just outside of the table support, though, so I may have to enlist another tripod here as a camera support um, if I can't shoot it freehand, or if uh, if I can rig up a second bounce here to get that light to fall in. Uh, I may just um, sort of lean this bounce up against something. And usually, um, with a bounce like this, where I'm sort of filling the backlight, I want to try to bring that in as close to my subject as I can, as long as I'm not in frame. Um, so with, uh, with this setup, right, I'm able to um, throw this light around. I'm very excited to see what's going on in Photoshop with these. Um, the last thing I'll say is um, full auto on your camera is only going to get us so far. And so um, a couple of things you can consider uh, to sort of start making some adjustments on uh, in order to make this happen uh, better for you. If you're really frustrated that your images in the studio are getting a little blurry, uh, you're going to want to make sure that your shutter speed is high enough that you can do some freehand shooting. Um, if your camera's sitting flat on the table, this is not going to be an issue for you. If you're on a tripod, this is not going to be an issue for you. But I did almost all of my images uh, in this sort of studio setup freehand, uh, which means that my shutter speeds needed to be up in the hundreds, right? Um, 1 2 50th is, enough, is, you know, I'm making sure that I can still shoot nice and sharp. Uh, if I start to get down into the 100s or even below 100th of a second, um, my kind of nice thin edges of paper and the kind of close-up studio environment, it's going to get soft. Um, or, you know, if you get a little bit of shake to you, uh, it's going to get blurry. And so you could switch your camera into S, shooting mode, which is shutter priority. And you can just make sure that your shutter speed is up in the 100s. Now, uh, the hang up here is that the faster your shutter speed is, the darker your overall image gets. And so to compensate for that, your camera is going to open up the aperture. Uh, the lens that I'm shooting with on this uh, Nikon D600 is the, um, uh, is their Nikon or the Nikkor 50 millimeter 1.8. Now those numbers may mean almost nothing to you, uh, except for the last number. I want you to pay very close attention when we talk about lenses to that last number, 1.8. 1.8 is the f-stop or the uh, minimum aperture. And a small number, 1.8, means a wide open lens. And so uh, a short lens, there's not, a, there's not very much barrel there, a short lens uh, with a wide open aperture is going to allow me to shoot in lower light environments, like a studio. This studio may seem really bright to you, but to a camera, this is a pretty dark space. Uh, consider sort of, you know, camera's bread and butter, a bright sunny day. Um, the amount of light in my uh, tutorial recording studio is tiny compared to a nice sunny day. Uh, if you're shooting with uh, sort of a kit lens that came with an Icon or a Canon, you very likely is sort of like um, maybe you're working with a th uh, uh, maybe uh, a minimum f-stop of somewhere in the 4 or 5 range. That's going to you know mean you need a lot more light. Uh, and so the small sort of Home Depot clip lights just aren't going to do the trick for you. Uh, the only solution in a small studio like that then is to slow your shutter speeds down, which is fine because we are working with an object that's not moving very fast, a piece of paper. Uh, but just means if you're getting below uh, sort of a hundredth of a second, you got to stabilize that camera somehow, set it down on the table, uh, borrow a tripod, or rig up some sort of stack of books or something like that where your camera is not in your hands. You move too much in order to make that work. Uh, in the next tutorial, we'll talk a whole lot more about how to take manual control over the camera. 
For now, let's jump over into Photoshop and talk about doing selective edits on these photographs we just took. Okay, so I've already got my images transferred to my laptop in order to do these edits. Um, if you're still running into issues getting images transferred from your camera to your computer, let's have a chat in the studio. Um, I really like just kind of pulling the card and plugging it directly into the computer, either using an adapter or something, but if all you've got is a cable, great, or if you just can't figure it out, uh, let's talk and I'm sure we can work something out. But in uh, once they're on the desktop, um, guys, I'm going to say this again, organize your assignments. I've got all of my pictures so far in a folder on my desktop called Photography Class. Since we're in our Exposure unit, I created a folder inside of there called Exposure. And uh, now we have two assignments going, right? There's our Monolite project, which was our very first attempt at this. The Monolite projects are really moody. They're, a lot, they're like heavy, dark shadows. Um, inky blacks, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, now, our the assignment that we just worked on today um, in the studio is called Fill Light, right? We're bouncing the light around a little bit. I want you to organize your pictures into folders that are named after the projects. Um, go ahead and sort through these. We'll come back to that digital workflow reminder uh, for the sake of, uh, of just kind of like kind of getting into this ritual, getting into this habit in the studio. Um, import and sort images into your folders. That way you're staying organized, right? Uh, we're going to make sure that we have um, uh, the right images. We're going to take a real close look at them. So select the images to retouch, and then we'll begin all of our editing in Adobe Camera Raw. Today, we'll be doing global edits and selective edits. Uh, we'll crop anything out that needs to be cropped. Save a PSD working copy onto your desktop folder, and then save that JPEG. Uh, to the online portfolio for credit. That means uh, you've got probably at least five to ten images in this folder and I'm going to cruise around here and just do a quick preview. Uh, it looks like uh, some of these still have some pretty dark shadows in them. I think this was sort of a practice directional shot. Not too bad. It's not too hot up here on the highlight, uh, but compare that to the very end of the photo shoot where I was doing a lot more uh, sort of bouncing light around uh, in this image, my background is much softer, uh, my values are much gentler, my shadows aren't inky black. And so keep in mind, right, remember how I had um, a studio set up where I was not firing light directly at this thing. It was bouncing up into a bounce card that was held over the top of the subject. So uh, imagine, right, for example, maybe on a large scale studio, light would bounce up hit the ceiling and sort of rain down on the subject in a really nice kind of soft diffused light. And then some of that light is captured again by the bounce on the right hand side and bounced back into the fill. So every time the light bounces around like that, its effects diminish significantly. So imagine just like an absolute fire hose of light coming right out of the light source. It bounces off of the um, bounces off of the bounce card and uh, it gets diffused a little bit and softened. And then it bounces off a second bounce card and gets softened even more. This is uh, this is how photographers are able to achieve very soft tones so that when we come to Photoshop, uh, we don't have these extreme darks and extreme lights that we need to correct for. Uh, we can actually kind of build some of that into the photograph um, more deliberately instead of having to always kind of correct for mistakes in the studio. So this is the image that I will uh, do my edits on today. I'm going to just kind of take a look at this number 9146. And since I've got this NEF file tag now because I shot in uh, RAW, let's just take a quick look and see what sort of footprint, digital footprint these have on the computer. 27 megs or so is what an, uh, the RAW files coming out of my camera are. Now just compare that to the JPEGs that I shot uh, for the previous assignment uh, at 6 megs. So I'm looking at you know, like f almost four times the size, four or five times the size um, uh, of a physical footprint. That means that every one of these JPEGs, every one of these NEF files is four or five photographs of my highest quality JPEGs. That gives you a sense of how much more information there are in these pictures and how much information is lost when you compress to, uh, to JPEG, right? Uh, so without uh, without doing anything other than just shooting in raw, we'll get a better exposure. I'm going to go to Photoshop, do a file open. And actually, you know what? I don't need to do this kind of goofy trick where I do file open. Because it's an NEF file, I can just drag and drop that right onto Photoshop and it should automatically launch into Adobe Camera Raw. Uh, that's the really handy thing about working in RAW. Uh, the program is already set up for that. 
So these images will be edited in black and white again. I can do my uh, conversion up here where it says edit, or I could also choose um, uh, from a couple of other options in here. Adobe Monochrome uh, is a good one to work in. Now take a look at how much softer, and I'll just say, I'll just say, all right, it looks flat. It's not very contrasty. It's actually not quite as exciting as some of those other images were. You can imagine those like deep, dark blacks and the contrasty stuff. Now we can go there. We can get that out of this image if we need to. But what I'm more interested in, in looking at is that there are no clipped highlights and no dark, dark, dark shadows. I've got detail everywhere in this image. And that is a really great place to begin your edits in Photoshop. Uh, there really is no way to build pixels. If it's clipped out, it's gone. There's nothing there. Uh, so it's much nicer to start with an image that has all the information there. Uh, so from here, I'm going to do some global edits. I can do work with the overall exposure of the image. Uh, I could do work by increasing or decreasing a bit of contrast. Although, to be honest, I tend to prefer to do the contrast work in, um, in Photoshop using curves. And uh, I could start to potentially do a little bit of uh, selective editing here using the highlights and the shadows adjustments. Uh, these adjustments are only going to affect the sort of lower 50%, the sort of dark end of the spectrum, or the higher 50%, the higher end of the spectrum. Uh, that's sort of how those end up edits work. And I'm going to totally stay away from the whites and the blacks adjustments. While those make um, really great kind of crunchy edits, crunchy blacks, and one of the kind of easy mistakes to make there is um, that it really isolates just such a narrow band of that color that um, it's really easy to sort of clip out those images. So I'm actually going to, you know, probably do the majority of my work with overall exposure and uh, and then do, um, do the bulk of my work in Photoshop proper because I did so much work in the studio to balance the lighting here. I don't have to do too much balancing. The last thing I think I'm going to do though is add a touch of clarity. Now clarity is interesting. It's going to look a little bit like contrast, um, but it also introduces this other uh, sort of a photo edit called sharpness and we'll talk about sharpness a little bit um, uh, in Photoshop and how uh, sharpness and contrast are related but slightly different uh, but you'll probably like that especially if you have a lot of revealed edges it's going to give some crunch to the photographs uh, and then I'll finish doing some more of that work in Photoshop so let me pull down my highlights just a tiny little bit here because they're starting to once I added that clarity they got a little bit too hot up top and then I'll open that into Photoshop. Now, once we're in Photoshop, um, I'm going to introduce probably one of the most powerful tools about Photoshop. The reason we use Photoshop and not any one of the other kind of free softwares out there is the layer mask, right? Or how do we edit specific pieces of a photograph and not others? Now, this is a pretty well-balanced image. I'm going to minimize here and, uh, and go back to my monochromes just to kind of show how I, might, um, how I might take advantage of this. Because my monochrome images were much more dramatically lit, uh, I think it probably makes more sense to, um, to demonstrate this here. So I'll open up the, uh, the Photoshop document version. Take a look at uh, how dramatic the lighting shift is in my image here. It's a really obvious kind of highlight on one side, shadows on the other side. And I did a couple of edits here, right? I added a bit of contrast and I could add some more edits by adjusting the overall curves. Uh, but this image is sort of borderline too dark on one side. And uh, because I shot it as a single light source, I'm entering into this sort of frustrating zone where if I adjust the right side of the image to be about the right darkness, I blow out the left side. If I bring down the left side to be about where I want it, I, you know, I clip out the right side. Like it's, it's really hard to get just one edit to do everything I want. Enter selective edits. How do I get just the right side of the image or maybe just the shadows to sort of edit and uh, and this is where I find the uh, the layer mask to be really exciting so what I'm going to do is set the sort of right side of the image about where I want it to be and I'm going to tell this layer mask to only apply that edit in the sort of right half of the image to do that I'll lay in uh, something called a gradient I'm going to just grab my gradient tool here over in the toolbar, make sure that my uh, gradient is linear, and I'm going to sort of pull a gradient across the space of this photograph, and you'll notice that it immediately throws that gradient into uh, the curves layer, um, the sort of white box right next to the curves layer. But notice now 
how because that gradient sort of follows the sort of right hand side of this image, the edit only affects the right hand side. This is pretty cool. Now gradients are kind of a blunt instrument, right? They don't, they're not as precise as I would like it to be. But uh, I'll tap backslash and you can sort of see uh, they splash, Photoshop has this option to sort of splash this in in red. You can see where um, where the, uh, the curves layer is being uh, sort of used and where it's not. If you've ever used uh, that blue masking tape, right, to paint off anything in the house, this is pretty much the same idea. Um, Photoshop calls it a layer mask, masking tape. It's the same basic idea, right? You want to um, get paint somewhere, but not somewhere else. You want to get the edits somewhere, but not somewhere else. Um, now this is this can be really confusing, especially when I introduce something like the brush and I say, okay, now we're going to go back and forth with these edits and, uh, and try to sort of feather in an edit that only sort of affects other areas. And with that paintbrush, I can both add and remove, right? The, uh, the masks are not fixed, so I can sort of paint it in and even use sort of opacities. This gets really confusing, especially if you're thinking paintbrush, that should be adding black or that should be adding white. Um, let me actually open up two totally unrelated images and, uh, and use them as a bit of an example. So I've got uh, a photograph that I made and a photograph that a student made, and I'm just going to sandwich them together. And uh, you'll see how, you know, obviously ridiculous this is, uh, but it's going to work to sort of illustrate my point. I'll just sort of drop one image right into the other, and uh, I'll just kind of make one large enough that they sort of map on top of each other more or less. Give it a little crop, and, uh, and I'll layer these images together using a layer mask. Uh, so what we've got going on here in Photoshop, you can sort of see over here in the layers palette, on the top layer, I've got a picture of my daughter, and on the bottom layer, a uh, picture that my student took of uh, somebody he met who has a horse farm. And, uh, and I'm going to use a layer mask, add a layer mask to this layer one, and demonstrate the same effect that I just demonstrated in the previous photograph. I'm going to first start by adding a gradient to this layer mask. I'll use the same linear gradient, kind of pull it at about a diagonal across the image, and you'll see almost immediately that uh, that gradient shows up in the toolbar, and also it applies the effect sort of gradually across the image. Over here in the lower part of the image, I see uh, only this layer one. Up here in the upper left hand corner, I see only layer zero, and then there's this kind of blurry interstitial space. If, and this gets really awesome, I love this about Photoshop, if you grab your brush, paintbrush, keyboard shortcut B, and you're working with black and white, you can sort of set those, uh, kind of reset those in the bottom of the toolbar if you were doing any color work. Uh, and I like to keep my hand on the keyboard shortcut X to toggle back and forth between them. Now black, as a brush, cuts, and white repairs. And so as you're working with the layer mask, you can um, sort of work live. And this is really where Photoshop starts to be a little less about photography and more about sort of artistry, right? Um, think about the layers that go into a painting and how you might be able to sort of stack multiple layers of color to build underneath. Well, in photography, you can do the same thing. And to make this really cool, you can take the opacity of that brush and go anywhere from 100% opacity that just sort of slams the images together to a duct opacity. Let's just kind of put it down here in a roughly 50% or so, so you can see how multiple images can exist in the same image plane, uh, what you might call a double exposure in traditional photography. But in this case, I'm just editing these two images together. Now, if I use backslash again, you can sort of see that red splashing. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that Photoshop is going to help us see this. It'll show you with a little icon down here in the layer mask. I can see it in red. I can even still brush in that mode, right? So I can kind of see where the mask is and where it isn't. But I, I don't like to get too lost in the weeds of how do I know where I'm at. I really like to focus uh, visually, right, on just what I'm seeing happen in the image itself. If I get too lost in the kind of uh, mapping of where this is and where it isn't, um, I, it gets confusing to me. I'd more, I'm much more likely just sort of like focus on the photograph itself. So let's go back to our exposures, right, and figure out like, well, why does it work here? Well, it works because the curves layer um, is an effect, right? And I can either apply that effect 
or not. Uh, so let me jump all the way back to the image that we're editing for today. Um, what I'm going to want to do in here is apply some edits, some curves to maybe darken the shadows inside of this curve here. I'm maybe going to brighten something like the background, but I only want those edits to affect specific areas. So let's start with just the shadows. I'm going to add a curves layer and deepen the shadows throughout my piece. Uh, something, say, just kind of like this. And uh, I don't want it to apply to everything, so I have one or two approaches I can do. I'll grab that brush again, and the keyboard shortcut to make that brush bigger or smaller is brackets and braces. And I am going to cut that, uh, cut that edit out of the background, right? I don't really want my background to sort of have the same heavy, dark feeling. I only really wanted the kind of darker shadows to exist inside my subject and I'm brushing out that edit from where it was otherwise applying to, uh, to the inside. This is really cool. So now I've only got those deep dark shadows inside the piece. Uh, or maybe more specifically, I could only apply it to the kind of inner curves and pull it off the outsides. Now the brush that I have is a soft round. If I go to the control bar up here where my brush um, sort of has these options, if you don't see these options up here, go to Window, uh, control or window options, sorry, and uh, you can switch between a hard edged brush and a soft edged brush. Uh, if I look under here under general brushes, right, these are the sort of different shapes we have, and built into Photoshop is any number of custom brush heads that you can really do some amazing creative work in Photoshop with. But the soft round is going to kind of keep my edits light and sort of keep them from getting too complex. So as I do my work here, as I add contrast, uh, as I add sort of light areas and dark areas to the image, um, I can apply them in very, very specific ways. Uh, and I really like that feature in Photoshop itself. Now, toward the end of our photo edit here, as I go through this uh, process of balancing my lighting, I'm going to grab keyboard shortcut C and crop out anything that I don't need. Like, oops, I got a tripod sort of sitting there in the corner. Uh, not really crazy about that. I'll pull that guy out. And uh, uh, I'm also going to add one more adjustment to this photograph. We're going to sharpen it. And there are many, many ways to sharpen images in Photoshop. Uh, but let's go to the background layer, do a command J, and that's going to duplicate the background. We'll go up to filter, other, high pass. Now the high pass filter is actually a traditional video editing filter and depending on the resolution of your photograph uh, you will have to sort of experiment with your pixel radius. I'm going to stay somewhere in the 5 pixel radius or so for a 20 megapixel image. Click OK and uh, that looks really strange. That didn't do anything. That actually ruined my picture. Uh, but I'm going to go up to where it says normal and overlay that option. And if I zoom in just a little bit, Command Plus, you can see that I've slightly sharpened just the edges of my photograph. I'll turn that on and off. You can see it just crispens up the edges. Uh, this is really handy for these tight studio images, uh, especially if I'm trying to, uh, especially if I'm trying to kind of show off uh, the sort of clean edges and crisp darks and lights. So I've got a little bit more work to do on this. I'm going to work it up and show it to you in class. I'm excited to see uh, where you guys go with this and what kind of cool lighting setups you've got. Remember, detail everywhere. Uh, bounce that light around to sort of soften all the edges and, uh, and have fun with this, guys. Make images that you're excited about. I'll see you in the studio.